here. All right, so I've got my Lightspeed platform there, and you can see I'm up. Uh, this is my uh, demo. I'm up $1,000 in the demo today, still holding a little bit of position there. Uh, can you guys see? All right, uh, sounds like you can. Okay, fantastic. All right, so let me go full screen on this presentation. So what we'll do is um, we'll jump into the slides. I'm going to go over my uh, momentum day trading strategy. I'm going to talk a little bit about risk management, stock selection, and setting up your charts. And then we're going to jump back out and I'll go back into Lightspeed where I can look at any charts that you guys want me to look at or uh, answer questions that you have. All right, so let's see. go full screen here. So um, looks like we're going to have a great turnout today, which is awesome. I want to thank you guys all for uh, being here uh, this afternoon. I know uh, for anyone on the East Coast, today is uh, probably a snow day. It's uh, snowing here. So hopefully we'll have good uh, internet connection through the webinar. It, it should be okay. Um, now, ground rules for today, uh, again, just to reiterate, uh, what Rob mentioned, that this is for educational purposes only. I'm not a registered financial advisor, um, so none of this is uh, specific advice. This is all about uh, me teaching you the techniques that I've used to make a living as a day trader. Now, if you've uh, been interested in the markets for a while or kind of dabbling, uh, you'll realize that this uh, webinar is going to change the way you think about day trading. I have a very specific approach to how I trade the markets. And uh, this approach last year made me over $222,000. This year I started January 1st with a $583 trading account. And as of right now, I'm up over $51,000. So my goal is to uh, hit 100 grand and then uh, I guess uh, set a new goal. Hopefully I'll uh, get there um, by the end of first quarter, which is looking realistic. All right, so I'm going to teach you a little bit about the strategies that I've used and um, give you uh, some pointers on how to find the right types of stocks to trade. Um, so now to give you guys a little bit more uh, background about myself, for those of you who don't know, uh, I founded Warrior Trading in 2012 as a blog. And I found it as a blog to chronicle my experiences learning to trade the markets. And I also wanted to create a community where traders could come connect, exchange ideas, and, and build friendships. And then in 2014, I taught our first day trading course, which I've now taught to uh, thousands of traders all around the world. And when I taught that course, my mission, and this is also the mission when I started Warrior Trading, it was to help uh, prevent beginner traders from going through the same frustrations that I went through. It cost me over $30,000 in losses and over $100,000 total before I actually started making a profit as a trader. So to help beginner traders, in 2015, I took a break from teaching classes to write a book. And that book has become a bestseller. You can find it on Amazon uh, and Barnes and & Noble. It's a bestseller in the risk management genre, which is a very uh, niche genre. It's not a Harry Potter or a Da Vinci Code. But for anyone looking uh, for information about day trading, it has been very popular. All right. Uh, now, over the years, I have worked with literally thousands of students. We've got over 3,000 traders uh, that are part of the Warrior Trading community and that log in to trade side by side with me every single day. And I think one of the reasons that we've been really popular is because we focus on a very simple strategy. It's not designed to, you know, make anyone a millionaire overnight. It's not about getting rich quick. It's about finding um, a technique to generate just modest profits from the market. And for me, I started with goals uh, as small as 100 a day and 200 a day. And then I've been able to scale those up. Uh, last week, I had a day where I made $22,000. So uh, this is uh, to say that, yes, you can be very successful as a trader, but it always starts small. And, and you build on what's working. So to start with setting your foundation, um, I'm going to start really by giving you uh, some insight into risk management, because risk is one of the things that uh, most traders really struggle with. All right, but before I do that, um, over the years, I've also worked with a lot of big companies uh, to provide education to their clients, including uh, Benzinga, eSignal, and um, several brokers, of course, including Lightspeed. Now, I've been featured on the Huffington Post. I'll show you that article in a little bit, Seeking Alpha, MarketWatch, and Investing.com. 
on uh, so our social media channels. We're on YouTube. We've got over uh, 1.5 million views on our most popular video. And between our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, all the social media profiles, we've got over 460,000 followers, which is uh, pretty incredible. Now, a lot of people have also said um, some really nice things about us, including Dan Merkin. He's the CEO of Trade Ideas, uh, which is a multi-million dollar tech company. And they work closely with Lightspeed uh, on several projects. And uh, he called me one of the top teachers for traders and investors. In 2016, we were nominated for a Benzinga FinTech Award for Best Educator, which is also something that we are pr really proud of. So uh, this is to say that we are uh, very active in this space uh, with traders uh, and investors. And one of the things that's also very cool is you guys have probably all seen, there's a lot of educators out there. And a lot of them make these promises that you'll make a million dollars trading. You'll be able to you know, drive a uh, I don't know, Lamborghini or something like that, uh, fly on a private jet, ship, sipping champagne and all that stuff. Uh, that's all good and well for marketing. But the reality is that's not what most people uh, are looking for when they start trading. Now, most of our students are looking for sustainability and financial freedom in a sense. A lot of our students are... Um, retired. They're looking to make a little extra money in their retirement. They're not thinking about making millions of dollars, but making an extra two, three, four hundred dollars a day uh, would make a really big difference. Uh, and after all, you know, two hundred dollars a day consistently is over fifty thousand dollars a year. So I want to get you guys started on um, the path towards trading consistency, and um, it, it really is going to start with understanding the dynamics of the market and understanding risk management. One of the cool things about Warrior Trading is that every single day we have thousands of traders logging in, as you can see here, from all around the world. Uh, so I'm not sure where you guys are all logging in from uh, this afternoon. As you guys probably know, I'm new in New England and it's uh, snowing here today. But I'm sure for some of you it's uh, a nice, sunny, warm day. All right, now um, let's uh, jump in here um, and get started. So uh, as you guys know, when I got started trading, it took me a long time. Uh, it was trial and error. I tried to learn everything myself. And one of the challenges uh, for me with uh, providing education to day traders is that inherently day traders are usually the type of people that want to be independent. They don't want to um, you know, be told what to do. They don't want to go take a class or anything like that. You know, when you are thinking about becoming a day trader, it's, you know, it's a very independent, self-sufficient type of um, you know, goal and, and mentality. And so that's in direct contrast with me trying to um, teach you guys and, and for you to, to be really good listeners. So I hope that you'll um, learn from some of my mistakes, uh, including a day where I lost over $30,000 in the market because I was overconfident and I was impatient. I wanted to figure it out all on my own, but the reality is, um, you know, that path took a very, very long time. And you don't have to go down that same path. When there are people out there uh, like myself, who are uh, happy to share, um, you know, for in, in my case, my templates for trading. Okay, so uh, when we talk about risk, now I can tell you without a doubt that it is an inability to manage risk that's the leading cause of failure. And I'm sure, um, you know, Rob would agree, and, and almost any uh, broker that looks at trading accounts would probably feel the same way. You see traders who uh, come in, they uh, blow up their accounts, they have really big losses, they make mistakes. And at the end of the day, no one goes into a trade thinking this trade could cost me $30,000 or, you know, or this trade could blow up my account. But then suddenly it happens. So uh, it's a lack of understanding of risk. Risk is very present in uh, the world of you know, being a day trader and trading stocks. And I think we know that on the one hand, but then we don't exactly understand how it works and how we can take certain steps to mitigate risk. So, in what ways uh, do we see risk as traders? Well, number one, we see exposure risk. Exposure risk is something that uh, day traders uh, can minimize by holding stocks for short periods of time. But exposure risk is the amount of money you have in a trade, so your share size multiplied by uh, the price of the stock, and then multiplied by the amount of time you're holding that position. That is your total exposure. Um, now, number five is time in the trade. We can reduce time in the trade uh, and by reducing the time in the trade, we are reducing our exposure risk. But exposure risk, you know, if you buy 1,000 shares of a you know, $20 stock, you've got $20,000 of exposure. 
and this is the reality as traders that that money is out there. Now, we may say our stop is 10 cents and we're only risking $100, but if something happens where the stock gets halted or you know there, it drops suddenly in the middle of the day, we do actually have more exposure than that. So the second type of risk is the distance between uh, your entry price and your stop price. So if you buy a stock at $5, 1,000 shares, and your stop is $4.90, you're risking $100. And that type of risk is very easy for us to understand, but we've all been in the situation, for those of us who have been trading, where you get in a stock at 5, you set your stop at 490, and then it suddenly drops to 470 or, you know, or 460. And maybe your stop didn't fire, maybe it was a mental stop only, you didn't actually have a live stop order, and now suddenly you're down a little bit more on the trade. So the distance between your entry and your stop, although it is definitely a type of risk, you also have to think about um, number three, which is slippage. Is this the type of stock that when you send the order, uh, it may end up dropping another 10, 15, 20 cents, and you get filled lower? So thinly traded stocks, especially small caps, can be more uh, prone to slippage, whereas very thickly traded stocks like you know, your Facebook and Twitter and stocks like that, those usually have so much liquidity that you can get in and out with pretty big positions without too much slippage. Now, number four is float and volatility, and this, again, uh, much higher in small cap stocks. Small caps uh, with low floats are the types of stocks that can move 50 to 100 percent in a single day. Uh, we very rarely see that on stocks with floats of 100 or 200 million shares, but stocks with a float of under 20 million shares, we see it on uh, almost a regular basis, almost on a weekly basis, where these stocks uh, they come out with news and they suddenly squeeze up 50 to 100 percent. On the one hand, as active traders, uh, these are all opportunities and these are opportunities for us to quickly grow our accounts. But on the other hand, there's a lot of volatility there. Volatility is, is good, but it, it, it means more risk. There's more potential for us that if we make a mistake, it's going to be very costly. Number five, the time in the trade. You know, the longer we're holding a position, uh, the more we, uh, the more risk we take on. Whether you're holding for five minutes, five hours, or, or or several days, and of course, the longer in terms of days, the more your risk goes up. When you think about, well, the stock, you know, when is it going to report earnings? When is uh, a headline going to come out? Or if it's a pharmaceutical stock or a biotech, you know, what if they are currently running clinical trials and suddenly you know, there's bad news. Or if there's good news, I mean, you can be a hero overnight or you can be a zero overnight. And that's the challenge with, um, you know, holding stocks overnight, especially in some of the more volatile sectors. And then the sixth type of risk is halt risk. So you guys may or may not know this, but at any time a stock can get halted. And it can get halted for a variety of reasons. Uh, but the fact is, when a stock is halted, you can't do anything. You just have to sit and wait. So stocks often get halted on circuit breakers where they squeeze up 10% and they're halted, it's a volatility pause, halted for five minutes and then trading resumes. And that period of time gives traders the opportunity to kind of think about, okay, what's the headline? Why is the stock going up? And uh, sort of regain composure a little bit. It's to help reduce volatility in the market. So it kind of gives traders an opportunity to step back. Uh, other types of halts can be uh, a stock can get halted pending news. If they're going to result material news in the middle of the day, uh, a stock can get halted, and if the news is bad, it can resume lower. And that's a risk. And that risk uh, really is, especially when you're holding stocks for longer periods of time, that risk goes up and up and up. So these are uh, you know, six of the types of risk, and I'm sure there's others, but uh, at least six that we face almost every single day as traders. Okay, so there's a lot of risk, and you guys are realizing that. Trading is risky. Okay, so what steps can we take to mitigate our risk? Well, at the end of the day, good risk management is what separates the winners from the losers. And you guys have probably heard the statistic that 90% of day traders will fail to make money. Uh, and, that, and that's true. Those failures, though, they, I believe, are a result of trading uh, with a lack of education and an inability or a lack of understanding of how to manage risk. But here's the thing, I think that failure uh, is actually a choice that traders make. And they may not know it, but I think it's a choice because you can choose to learn how to manage risk. You can choose to get education. 
And when you choose to get training to learn how to manage risk, you know, you're choosing to essentially take the steps required to be a successful trader. So for all of you guys, uh, the fact that you're you know, in this webinar that, you're, that you logged in today or that you're watching it on the replay, it tells me that you want to learn more and that you realize that the market is not something you can just kind of jump into and expect to be profitable right away. You've got to really study and train. So that's all really good and I'm, I'm really happy that all of you are here today. Uh, the fact is, if you want to be a successful trader, you have to learn how to manage risk. And it's also a good idea to surround yourself with other traders who are successful because it's one of these things where you kind of want to surround yourself with the type of people that you want to become. So it's always a good idea to surround yourself with profitable traders as much as you can. And that's one of the benefits, obviously, of being um, in a community like Warrior Trading. Now, the golden ratio uh, that I always kind of refer back to is two to one. And when we talk about risk, and this is important, I risk $100 to make 200 Now, if I risk 100 to make 200 how often do I have to be right to break even? If I risk 100 to make 100 I've got to be right 50% of the time. If I risk 100 to make 200 I actually only have to be right 33% of the time to break even before commissions. So doesn't that sound nice, a strategy where you could be right only 30% of the time, 33% of the time, and potentially break even? That's you setting the bar low. It's making it easy for you to be successful. But a lot of traders, they don't understand profit-loss ratios. They don't understand risk management. So they just, without knowing it, end up risking, you know, let's say $1,000 when the profit potential was only to make 100 to 200. That's a negative profit-loss ratio. You don't want to risk more than you have the potential to make. I mean, you wouldn't do that if someone laid out the numbers for you. But a lot of traders take positions without really doing those calculations. So for me, whenever I look at a trade, I'm thinking about the profit-loss ratio. And although I sometimes have trades where I lose more than I intend, on average, uh, I make sure that I'm around two to one. So I might risk 500 to make 1,000. I might risk 1,000 to make 2,000. I might risk 2,000 to make 4,000. But the ratio is always the same, because that is a ratio that's sustainable. Success in trading is um, it's kind of like sports in a way. It, it all comes down to your metrics. You either have metrics that, um, you know, it's like you'll, you could look at a trader on a piece of paper and say, yeah, this is a trader that I want to stand behind or, you know, and I want to recruit to my team, like if he was a you know, baseball player or something. Or you say, you know what, no, this, this guy doesn't have the, 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 the metrics. The statistics aren't there. So what are those statistics? Well, you've got your profit-loss ratio, your average winners versus your average losers, and then you have your percentage of success. So when I have students that uh, join our classes and work with me and they start trading and they're only trading at 30 or 40 percent success, I don't usually worry that much because I know that accuracy is something that improves with practice. What I really look at is what's their profit-loss ratio? Are they showing me that they know how to manage risk in a smart way? So when I see that their average winners are $200 and their average losses are only 100 that's when I tell them, look, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. Keep practicing. Don't worry about the accuracy. It'll get better the more you practice. Now, one of the things that you'll also realize, once you've built this uh, foundation in understanding risk management, you'll realize that sometimes the best trade is simply no trade at all. That sitting in cash is OK. Cash is a position, and it's a powerful position. If I look at a trade and I can't get a um, you know, 2 to 1 profit loss ratio, if I don't think I have the potential to double what I'm risking, I'm not going to take that trade. A lot of traders have to fight against the fear of missing out. And the fear of missing out is when we see a stock that's running, we see a stock that looks strong, uh, and we want to just jump in. And we kind of sometimes put risk management to the wayside when we're in that mindset. We just want to get a piece of the action. Next thing you know, you bought a stock way too high. It starts to roll over. And now your loss starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's how you end up losing 1,000 when the profit potential might have only been 100 or 200. You know, it starts to get emotional. So you always have to come back to that calm, cool, collected uh, you know, mindset where you're really analyzing every single trade you take. Now, for me, last year, I made $222,000, and I took about 750 trades. So there's about 250 trading days in the year, which means I traded about three times a day. And I recently ran into a stockbroker who was telling me um, uh, his experience dealing with day traders and how so many of them lose money. And I said, well, how, how often were most of them trading each day? And he said, most of them were trading 30, 40, even 50 times a day. 
And I said, well, that, that's the problem right there. It's impossible to manage risk when you're taking that many trades. It, I mean, just in terms of uh, decision fatigue, you can't make that many quick decisions uh, you know, a day and, and still count on making a good decision. You simply can't. So I always focus on um, quality versus quantity. I trade less, and I trade the best, and I leave the rest. All right, now these are three tips that you guys uh, should write down that can help you get better at managing risk. So number one, before you take a trade, you should ask yourself, how much am I risking? And you should write it down. You should get in the habit of doing that because you, you can't take a trade until you know what your risk is. It's, to me, a trade is not a trade until you know how much you're risking and how much uh, you could potentially make if it works. All right, number two, only take trades when you've got the realistic potential to double your risk and profit. Whether you're risking 100 to make 200, 1,000 to make 2,000, or 10,000 to make 20,000, you need that profit loss ratio. And number three, I always add to winners, not to losers. Now, some traders like to average down. So if they're in a trade, they've gotten it $3 and it drops to two, they could buy more shares at two and bring their average down to 250. Well, to me, I say, look, if I got into a trade and it drops to two, this is a bad trade. It's not working out. I should have probably sold it a lot sooner. And instead of adding more money to the situation and making it worse, I'm just going to cut my losses and get out. And you know, even today, I had a red day trading today. And although it's frustrating and I never like to have red days, it's much better just to cut the losses and move on than to add to the losses because they'll, they'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's how you eventually end up with a loss that can put you uh, out of the game and end and, and your career. You never want to empower a trade to potentially end your career. I mean, that's obvious, but uh, when, when we're in the, in the heat of the moment and we're so tunnel vision on looking at our P&L and watching these trades, we can lose sight of that. All right, so now that you kind of have a, a cliff notes and sort of tip of the iceberg understanding of risk management, uh, let's talk a little bit about choosing stocks to trade. This is important. What we can do, essentially, is we can choose the strongest stocks to trade every single day, and by doing that, we've taken steps to further reduce our risk as traders, right? Because if we choose risky stocks, we're increasing our risk for loss. So to me, a risky stock would be pretty much any penny stock. I don't trade penny stocks. Um, pretty much any uh, OTC stock. I don't trade OTC stocks. And uh, for me, I don't trade options either. It's not that you couldn't trade options, but I try to reduce my risk and keep it simple. Now, out of the thousands of stocks on the market, thousands and thousands, how do you choose which ones to trade? How do you find that needle in the haystack? That's really what it is. I mean, there are a small handful of stocks each day that are worth trading, but how do you find them? Well, one of the things uh, that I learned as a beginner trader as I was studying, and this was really, for me, the, the most important thing that I learned, I realized that almost every single day, there's a stock that's moving 20 to 30 percent. And you could look, you could check today. There are stocks today that move 20, 30 percent every single day. So I realized, okay, I got to figure out a system of finding those stocks before they make the big move. Looking at them in hindsight, day after day after day, I keep feeling like I'm missing opportunities. So I created the system. And what I did was I had to really um, break down the anatomy of the type of stock that had the potential to move 20, 30, 40 percent in a day. And guess what? All of those stocks had something in common. So once I figured that out, I was able to build a set of stock scanners to look for those stocks and just give them right to me. And this is kind of like, you know, when you're looking for that needle in the haystack, you can either go, you know, through each single piece of hay until you find it, or, you know, you smarten up and you use a magnet, right? You use a magnet and you find that needle instantly. You just saved yourself, you know, uh, thousands of hours of, of trying to find a needle and, um, you know, you, you just you cut straight to the chase, all right? So that's the same thing uh, with trading. And for me, when I break down the anatomy of these stocks, these are the four criteria that I'm looking at. Number one, float. Almost all of the stocks that make those really big moves have a float of under 100 million shares. A lot of them have floats even lower than that, but 100 million shares is kind of my threshold. Above that, I probably won't day trade it. Below that, I'm probably going to be interested. Number two, a catalyst. The strongest movers are almost always the result of some type of breaking news. You know, when a stock comes out with breaking news, whatever it might be, you know, it's they just got a $30 million contract or they got, 
you know, really positive clinical trial results or, you know, uh, uh, an analyst gave them a new price target. You know, any of these headlines uh, can attract the interest of active traders, where traders look and they think, wow, wow this is an opportunity right here. This stock uh, has great news. It's got a great daily chart. I'm going to take a stab at it. So I always look for catalysts. And this is kind of like the, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do you look for the catalyst or do you look for the stock that's moving and then try to find out what the news is? Well, there are headlines going through, uh, you know, literally, I mean, all day long on, on dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of, hun hundreds of stocks. So I don't check every single headline. What I do instead is I look at the stocks that are opening higher than they closed yesterday. That tells me something happened overnight. My job now is just to go check each of those stocks to figure out what that was. Is there news or is this just something, um, you know, is it a non-event? Number three, ideally these stocks, um, the, uh, the stocks that have home run potential almost always are stocks that have uh, a history of making big moves. So if a stock ran 30 or 40 percent at some point in the past, there's a good chance it could do it again if it has the right setup. So we always uh, create this list of former runners. I have a list of about 100 former runner stocks. These are stocks that have made big moves. And I know that any time they have a good headline, there's the potential that we could have you know, another uh, really big move. This doesn't guarantee it, obviously, but it's potential. And then number four, ideally, um, these stocks will have strong daily charts where the price is above the 200 exponential moving average. I can scan for all of these indicators. Now, I scan using trade ideas. And the cool thing with trade ideas is that it integrates really nicely with Lightspeed. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. So these scanners, I've taught them to look for the type of stocks that I love to trade. They search the market and they do all the heavy lifting. They come back and they give me the list of ideas. Now, I just have to manually search through these stocks to figure out what's the headline. You know, is, it, is this really good news? Is there something that's really interesting here? But generally, I just sort these by the highest relative volume. Whichever ones have the highest relative volume, and this is important, I'm using the word relative, because volume is not the same for every stock. Right? What is high volume for a stock like IBM is not the same as what's high volume for a stock like you know, Bank of America. These are very different stocks. So we talk about relative. What's high relative to normal? So I sort by the stocks ha experiencing the highest volume, uh, the highest above average volume versus what they normally experience. And that tells me these are stocks that lots and lots of traders are looking at. The traders are excited about that they want to get a piece of. Now each morning for me starts the same way. It starts by going through the gap scanners, breaking them down stock by stock until I find uh, usually three, four, sometimes five that look good. And this is what my watch list looks like uh, pretty much on um, every morning. I put together this watch list and I publish this for all of our students. So it saves our students the time of having to build a watch list on their own. Uh, but for those that want to build a watch list, that's fine too. This just helps them confirm that they're either looking at the right stocks or that we're all looking at the, you know, the same setups or that maybe they're, um, you know, got themselves lost looking at uh, poor quality setups. Helps them understand whether or not they're on track. So what I do is I break down the stock. What's the float? You know, what's the catalyst? How much is it gapping up? And why do I like the stock? What, what is the potential? What's the setup? All right, so here are a couple of tips to help you uh, choose stronger stocks uh, on a daily basis. Number one, only look at stocks with high relative volume. That means above average volume. All right, remember, stocks only trade on above average volume when there's a catalyst. And a catalyst can be something as simple as a technical breakout on the daily chart. It doesn't always have to be breaking news, although breaking news is ideal. Number two, check to see if the stock has breaking news. You can use uh, Lightspeed, you can use MarketWatch, Benzinga, StockTwits. You know, just check a couple sources and, and try to figure out, is there a headline here? Is there a reason the stock is moving up? And then number three, ask yourself if this stock is experiencing extremes. I only trade stocks at extremes. Okay, so that means I could look back at this on a daily chart and you know, six months from now I could say, yeah, that was a day that stock was worth looking at because it did something incredible. It made a really big move. So now let's um, start to look at uh, a couple of charts. 
One of the things that I always talk about is following the volume. This right here is an example on the left of a low volume stock. There's no volume in here. This pattern is, it's not even really a pattern. You know, it's just kind of a couple candlesticks, some algorithmic trading. Whereas this here, this is a stock that had very high volume. And so we start to break it down. Lots of volume. The first pullback, traders get into that. This is one of my favorite setups, buying the first pullback. Uh, down to the moving average. This is the nine exponential moving average. I buy the first pullback, sell through the push. Buy the second pullback, sell through the push. And this is a stock where uh, really in uh, the period of 30, 40 minutes, I could potentially make thousands of dollars just trading these pullbacks, this simple pattern. Now, I won't see this pattern every single day, but I've learned that uh, I can sit on my hands and wait for A quality setups because when I get them, uh, they can uh, more than pay for, uh, you know, the days where I was just sitting and waiting. All right, so uh, now let's uh, spend a couple minutes uh, breaking down the charts. I want you guys to understand um, how to set up charts. A lot of traders get very uh, complex with their charts, and I really like to keep it simple. Um, you don't need to have tons of indicators. Um, you know, to me, it, it can just confuse things. So this is what my average chart looks like. It's pretty simple, right? And I'm a trader who made six figures last year. So this tells you that you don't need all these fancy indicators on your chart to make good money. All I have are my moving averages. I've got the 200, I've got the 50, I've got the 20, and I've got the nine. All right, so I find my entries based on candlestick patterns. Uh, these indicators, these help me understand uh, the current price action and its context tells me whether the, uh, the stock is strong or weak, but I don't need uh, to have these on my charts in order to feel comfortable taking trades. You can see here, uh, these moving averages, these are very well-respected areas of support and resistance. This is a stock that uh, came up and ran into the 200 moving average. Now, if you've been able to see that on your chart, you would have known that this probably isn't a stock that you wanna buy right around $4 because it's gonna hit resistance right here. That's why I said I like stocks above the 200, not below it. You can see my moving averages are pretty simple. I just go in, pop them on here. We've got the 20, the 50, the 200, and the nine. They're all exponential moving averages. And this is another example of a stock coming up and running into its 50 moving average right here. So when we look at stocks, we wanna see relatively strong daily charts where we don't have a lot of this overhead resistance um, that comes in the form of moving averages. Here's another one. It's a perfect example. The stock gaps up. It looks great, but what does it run into? The 200 moving average right here it runs into that and then it rolls over off that level. It just, you know, it can't break through it. This is, there's too much resistance here. Uh, this is another example and we see it again and again and again. Now, on this day, this stock happened to be very strong. It was sort of a technical breakout. It, it was the first day to make a new high. It squeezed up from $2 all the way to 4 which is a 100% move. I mean, this is huge potential. And then the next day, it opened high and just sold off. Now, down here on this day, we started to squeeze up, but we were running into this resistance level, and we couldn't get over that, that price, that moving average. And here's another example where you've got tap once, tap twice, three times, four times, five times. So lots of traders are using these same indicators. And that's the thing. I like to use the indicators that are widely used by other traders because those are gonna have more validity. More traders using them means that more traders are respecting them. More traders are gonna set their stops around these levels uh, or start to take profit around these levels because they recognize this could be a source of resistance on the chart. This is a cool example where this stock uh, dropped down three times and kept bouncing right off that 200 moving average. So when it happened, when it was coming down on this third time and I saw this, I started to think this might be a good place for me to take an entry because of what it did this last time, right? So when you see it starting to pop up, you start to recognize there's a little bit of a pattern here. Now, uh, the one other uh, indicator that I will sometimes use, and you can see it on this chart, are Bollinger Bands. Now, the reason I like Bollinger Bands is because almost all of the price action of a stock will occur inside the Bollinger Bands. Therefore, when the stock is trading outside the Bollinger Bands, it indicates that this is really at extremes. 
And when I see a stock at extremes like that, I start to think it's due for a reversal. So when a stock is really extended and outside the Bollinger Bands, I start to look for a possible short. And you can see right here, we got the squeeze up outside the Bollinger Bands, shorting back down. Squeeze up outside the Bollinger Bands, and then shorting back down. So, you know, this, again, this is a different strategy for momentum, but when you have a stock that's extremely strong, that shows you lots and lots of momentum, at a certain point, you know that the tide is going to shift. And so, by having this indicator, you can understand, number one, as a momentum trader, when to start thinking about taking profits, and number two, if you want to trade reversals, that's when you can start to think about, you know, taking a short position or uh, taking a long on a, on a bottom bounce. Now, the Bollinger Bands that I use are really simple. I use the uh, 20 length with the 2.0 uh, standard deviation. It's nothing fancy. It's, again, the same Bollinger Band settings that everyone would use, the default settings. Uh, that means they're well respected. Lots and lots of traders are using them. Now, uh, tomorrow, uh, we're going to be hosting um, a webinar. And during that webinar, we're going to talk about uh, some of my other strategies, and we're going to talk in a lot of detail about trading bull flags. Bull flags are one of my favorite patterns. Uh, the bull flag, as you can see right here, is a pattern where the stock squeezes up and then pulls back, usually for three, some two, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four consecutive red candles, and then the first candle to make a new high is our entry. So the entry price is right here, and then we sell through high of day. This pattern right here, uh, I mean, it, it's easily made me uh, probably $50,000 in the last uh, couple months. I mean, I trade it again and again and again. Anytime I see it, it's a pattern I've got a lot of confidence in. So having the skill to identify the pattern in real time and then the confidence to take the trade, you know, that's, that's really where it's at. And it takes time to build that, but uh, that's the goal for any trader. This right here is a day where I was simply trading bull flags and I made over $4,500, which, you know, that's as much as most Vermonters make in, in a month. So to be able to make that in uh, one morning is definitely pretty impressive. The squeeze up, the pull back to the moving average, consolidation, next entry, pull back to the moving average, consolidation, next entry. This stock went from $2 to $10 in one day. So this had a lot of potential. This is the type of stock where, you know, an aggressive trader might get in here with 10,000 shares, maybe 20,000, and hold it for one, two, three points. I mean, big traders with big money, deep pockets, could easily make 10,000, 20,000, maybe $30,000 on a stock like this. All right, so uh, now to give you uh, a couple of tips for setting up your charts. Number one, keep it simple, all right? Now, you know, I only use the moving averages aside from the Bollinger Bands, which I don't use on all my charts, but keep it simple. If stocks are above the 200 moving average, that's usually strong. If they're below it, it's usually weak. Number two, if you're going to use indicators, use indicators that are really popular among retail traders, among active traders, because they're more likely to be well-respected. More people are going to be seeing that indicator. If you start using a really obscure indicator, you know, that whatever you found somewhere, you downloaded or whatever it might be, odds are not many people are watching that indicator. You know, you could say on the one hand, maybe that gives you an extra edge, but generally the reason these indicators work and the reason stocks even move is, is because of the collective trading mentality, because you've got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of traders all looking at these same patterns. And that's kind of what makes them either work or not work. These traders all recognize the same indicators, either to buy or to sell. So that's why I like to use it. If I'm going to use an indicator at all, I use the ones that are popular among retail traders. So maybe the MACD, maybe the RSI, maybe the Bollinger Bands or the moving averages. All right. So And then uh, the third tip is to use indicators, if you're going to use them, that will draw your attention to extremes in price action because those are opportunities. So, for instance, uh, one of the scanners that I have scans for RSI below 5 or RSI above 95. That, those are pretty extreme. I mean, RSI goes from 0 to 100. So anything between, you know, 5 and 95, I don't care about. But when we're up in the, the high 90s, like 97, 98, 99, that's a very extended stock, and it's possibly due for a reversal. Or I see a stock that has an RSI of 2 or 1, 
I'm going to start thinking, okay, this thing has to bounce at some point. I'm going to start looking for that reversal trade. So it's bringing my attention to extremes uh, in the market. All right, now I want to talk for a moment about uh, one of the struggles that I've had as a trader. Even though I've been doing this for a long time, uh, well, you know, like any other trader, there are times where I've fallen into ruts or I've had uh, my struggles. And one of the struggles that I've had in the past is that I would have months where I would make uh, ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and which is, you know, at this point that would be a small month. But in the past, that would have been a good month. And then in a single day, I would lose like five thousand dollars. And in one day, I'd give back, you know, half of an entire month. And it's such a devastating feeling to be trading, you know, whatever, for an entire month and then give back half your profits in one day. And imagine, for instance, like if you hired someone to build a stone wall for you and he builds a stone wall for an entire month and then you come along and knock down half of it. And, you know, I mean, how frustrating would that be? Well, unfortunately, this is kind of part of the life of a trader that every couple of weeks part of the wall is going to get knocked down. You know, yesterday I made ten thousand dollars. Today I lost uh, four thousand. So you know, a little part of the wall got knocked down. But when I'm making thirty or forty thousand dollars in a month, losing four thousand a day is not as bad. When I was making only ten, fifteen thousand in a month, losing that much in a single day was was really frustrating. I was getting back a lot of progress, and I realized that I needed to make some changes in my strategy, uh, really to um, you know to adapt in order to survive. So these are the changes I made. I said, first of all, I'm, I'm over trading. I'm trading lots of poor quality setups. So what I need to do is I need to increase my quality standard. And I, only, I need to only trade the best quality setups. I need to trade only A quality. And then number two, I said, if I only trade A quality setups, that means I'll be trading less. But in theory, my accuracy will go up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trade twice my regular share size when I take an A-quality setup. And I, this was a rule. I had to. I usually would take 2,500 shares. Now I would take 5,000. And that meant that when I was about to press the button to buy 5,000 shares, I started to feel a little nervous because I started to think, wow, if this goes the wrong way, I could lose 500 or 1,000 bucks pretty quickly. So isn't this going almost against that rule of you know, minimizing the losses? But here's the thing. Because I was feeling a little nervous, I inherently became even more selective. I would really only trade the best quality setups, and my accuracy went up a lot because I wasn't trading the junky stuff anymore. And as a result, over the course of that next month, I had the best month I've ever had at, the, at that time, which was $34,500 in profits in one month. I traded less, but the trades I took were higher quality with bigger size, and the profits were bigger. Now, I exported all of these trades along with my broker statements for our students so they could see. Now, even during this month, I had one day where I lost $4,000. I still had one bad day right here. But, because, and, you know, that was just the result of being aggressive, taking big size, and it not working. But because I had that mindset of only taking A-quality setups, this losing day uh, was basically the same size as my good winning days. So it didn't wipe me out. It, didn't, it wasn't setting me back uh, in a, a half a month or anything like that. It was just a small step back, and then I was able to rebound pretty quickly. During this uh, month, I traded with uh, just under 70% accuracy. So my accuracy was really good, and I had a really good profit-loss ratio. Now, what I uh, did, of course, uh, for our students was export all of these um, trades so they could see the report, and they could really understand what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong. And I also verified them with my broker statements because, you know, there's a lot of traders out there that make big claims. If I'm going to make a claim, I'm going to back it up with a broker statement and show you that, you know, this is real money. This is a real trade. Now, at the end of that month, I, uh, you know, it kind of was like, all right, this is great. I just had a terrific month. I've got this new sense of confidence. I trade less, but when I trade, you know, the setups are, are really strong and I'm making more money. So let's just continue on. This is now a set of rules that I'm just going to follow for a while. The next month I made $32,000. The month after that I made $29,000. And over the course of three months, I made $94,119 and I was featured on the Huffington Post. So this was um, the summer of 2016 and it was really 
it, I mean, it was a fantastic hot streak. To make $94,000 in three months of trading, it was, it was awesome. I went from having about 40000 in my account to having 150000 in fully verified gains. And that showed me that this strategy works. Not only has the strategy worked you know, for a long time, but with these slight modifications, I was able to really get this strategy to go exponential. I finished the year with $220,000 in profits, and then I started January 1st with $500. And the challenge was to see how long it would take me to grow that account into uh, $100,000. And so here we are. Today is day 27 of the small account challenge. And in 27 days, I've grown that account up to 51000 uh, which is you know, obviously a pretty, um, pretty impressive return. Now, I wouldn't have been able to do this if I weren't managing risk on every single trade I take. It comes down to managing risk, to choosing the strongest stocks, and then trading those bull flags, trading those patterns. Those patterns, I mean, I, I trade them every single day, and they really are um, my bread and butter. You know, traders have, it's always good to have a kind of a tool belt of different uh, strategies that you can refer back to in different patterns, but uh, without a doubt, the bull flag is my favorite. So again, we're going to host a webinar uh, where you guys can learn more about that. Um, but in the meantime, um, you know, at the end of that summer, I felt more confident than ever. Students in the classes, you know, they were kind of loving the new me because even though I traded less, the trades I took, uh, for the most part, were more successful, more profitable because I had this higher quality standard. All right. So um, what I want to do now, we've got about um, 10 minutes. I want to do some uh, Q&A and answer some questions that you guys have, and I can also um, look at some charts if you guys want me to. And uh, before we do that, I want to, um, you know, kind of just remind you guys that when I, I talk about, you know, the amount of money I make, and this is one of these things that uh, when we're traders, we're so, we're always thinking about, you know, how much money did someone make in a single day? And, you know, in the real world, you don't go up to people and say, how much money did you make last year? You know what I mean? Like, that's not something that you do. But as traders, it just kind of becomes uh, part of the deal. So I want to, and I should have prefaced um, what I said by saying this, but I'll, I'll say it now. Uh, when I say these things, I don't say them intending to, to be braggy. I'm not trying to brag. I'm not trying to, um, you know, to say I'm successful or I'm anything that special. I'm really not. I'm a trader who struggled for a really long time. Uh, and through all of those years of struggling, I was able to come out on the other side with a strategy uh, that for me has been able to give me the life that I kind of always wanted. I mean, I've got financial freedom. I can buy the things that I want. I don't have to worry about money. I, you know, work from home and it's really a, a great, um, a great job. I love trading. You know, I love every day the market uh, gives me something a little bit different. So, you know, for me, when I talk about the gains, uh, I'm talking about them really to show you that I am someone who um, has authority to talk about this topic. You know, there's a lot of traders out there who um, might have ideas of things that you should do or shouldn't do, but if they're not profitable, you know, it's hard to know whether or not that's someone that you should actually listen to. And, you know, I'm not trying to cast judgment, but... Um, just something that I wanted to say. So, um, all right, now uh, we'll back out of this um, here for a minute. Also, a reminder, um, almost every single day I go on Facebook Live, and you guys can uh, go on Facebook Live and watch me streaming. I do my midday recap at 12 noon Eastern time, and then I upload those recaps to YouTube. We've got about 70,000 followers on our YouTube channel, and um, love to have you guys check that out, subscribe, and you can get uh, those videos anytime I update them. I also do a daily podcast, and you can stream that podcast on your uh, iPhone or iPad or whatever that might be. All right, so um, let's see. So we'll jump out of this here, um, and you guys should be able to see the light speed screen. Now, one of the reasons that I, that one of the things I love about light speed um, is the fact that there's a couple things. This is a fantastic platform for day traders, number one, because you have direct access routing. So that means instead of just routing with one uh, option, like just say limit, for instance, you can go in here and you can choose to route directly to a market maker. So we see EdgeX right here, Edge. 
So I can choose to route directly to Edge. I can go down here and I can say, I want to route directly to him because he's sitting there with 300 shares. All right? Or I could say, I want to route directly to NASDAQ because he's sitting there with 100 shares. You can do direct routing. So that means your orders are usually going to be a little bit faster. And to me, if I see a buyer or a seller sitting on ARCA or sitting on NASDAQ, I might as well send directly to that market maker. If I send through just a standard limit order, uh, although it might be a little bit cheaper, save on commissions, um, to me, it just makes more sense to go direct to where I want to go. So number one, we've got direct access routing. And this is good especially for traders who uh, take you know, pretty large position sizes. You want to be able to uh, maybe get in using two different market makers. And so you have your, um, your super smart uh, orders, let's see where they are, um, where you can route to multiple market makers. And then you've got your hotkeys. And hotkeys for me are, um, I mean, th that's how I trade. Now, a lot of you guys know that I trade pretty quickly. So when I look for a stock, um, and we could just pull up a stock here. Let's look at um, BNTC. Um, let's see. This one we were trading a couple days ago. Let's see. This is kind of where I was thinking. Um, right in here. So on this day, um, let's see, where was this? Um, we have this stock, it just went absolutely parabolic. Um, let me zoom in on this a little bit. Let's see. So you can see right here on this day, we went from uh, this pullback down to 320 and then from 320 all the way up to uh, 420, pull back again, 360, and then I move up to 420 and 440. So a stock that had uh, a really big range. Now, when I see stocks that are moving like that, I want to be able to get in them quickly. And the fastest way to do that is to use the hotkey. So, for instance, I have Shift 1 set up. So when I press Shift 1, see how fast that order went through? I mean, I'm in the, the demo, but it goes through so quickly. Shift 1, I'm in the trade. Shift, shift 1, I'm in the trade. I want to get out of the trade, I use Control Z. And that's how quick, that is literally how quickly you can trade. Now, people that don't know about trading, they don't realize uh, how fast you can execute orders. That it can be just as fast as press one, press two, press one, press two. I mean, it's, it's super, super fast. So the way I do it is I go in here uh, to custom orders, and I have a uh, sell whole position, and I've got it both on the bid, minus five cents, and then on the ask. So, in this one, if I edit this uh, command, I've, got, I've chosen my route, and I'm saying that I'm going to sell on the bid, five cents below the bid, the full position, but I could also choose to sell half or sell a quarter. So if I'm in a trade and I'm suddenly up you know, 15, 20 cents, I don't need to start to fumble to you know, manually type in this order. And then, you know, say I'm on like a web browser, type in the order, and then go through a confirmation window, and then, you know, confirm it. All I have to do is press Control Z, and I'm out of the trade. It's that fast. So traders, active traders, we're looking for short-term opportunities in the market, where we see a stock that's suddenly spiking, whether it's from breaking news or a stock that was gapping up overnight. When we see these opportunities, we need to be able to move quickly. So having the tools to be able to trade fast, I mean, it really is a requirement. It would be like trying to ride a road bike in the mud, like on a muddy trail. I mean, you just, you're using the wrong tool for the job. And so whenever we have students in our classes that are, uh, you know, using a platform that's really not designed for active traders, I always tell them, look, guys, you need to use a better tool because if you're going to try to, if you want to keep up with some of the fastest traders out there, you need the right tool, and you know this is this is definitely it. All right, so um, let's see which is bullish: big share size on the left or the right, Quinn. So um, when I'm looking at um, the level two, what I'm looking for are if I'm a buyer, I like to see a big bid, and we can pull up a stock like um, you know this is oh, let's see maybe another one. Uh, Sprint, Siri, these are stocks that usually trade pretty thickly. Uh, Bank of America, I mean, you've got 2,500 shares here on the bid. That's not really a big bid. Um, Sprint has 31,000 uh, up on the ask. So a 31,000 share seller, you know, that's something that's going to uh, draw my attention. You know, if I saw this, I would think, you know what, I don't want to get in this at 78. 
until this guy moves out of the way. This guy's kind of like a ceiling. You know, he's got that big order there. It's just sitting there. Uh, it's going to be a problem. On the other hand, if I saw him sitting on the bid at 75, I would think, look, I can go ahead and get in here at 77 with 10,000 shares, and if I need to bail out, I see that there's a big bid right there that could, that could probably take my order. Now, it doesn't mean he won't cancel his order and disappear, but that's kind of what I look for. I look for a big bid on the left side when I want to be long bias, when I'm wanting the stock to go up, when I want to see strength. And then if I see this big uh, seller on the ask, that's when I'm going to start to feel a little bit cautious as a long bias trader. And I am uh, primarily a long bias trader. I sort of think of trading as like, and I don't know if this is the way all traders think of it, but I sort of think of it as like being a lefty or a righty. You sort of have a bias one way or the other. Uh, and for me, I, I just see the market from this long bias where I look and any pattern I see is like this is a setup that's going to go up or it's not going to work. I don't really look at the market from a short bias. So uh, I know that everyone's a little bit different on that, but uh, in any case. So um, let's see. Yeah, so that, you know, and this is kind of the way I have uh, my platform usually laid out. Um, I've got level twos on either side. Down here, I can manually prepare orders, so if I want to, you know, pre-market, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to buy the stock, 1,000 shares, and I want to get in at 1670. I can just type the order. I don't need to use the hotkey. Uh, but once I'm in the trade, then I'm going to use the hotkey to start selling. And I can do that uh, both to sell on the bid and the ask. So for this one, uh, I'm going to buy this. So I'm in at 78, and now I press, let's see, buy this. I can put orders out to sell on the ask. This one's kind of funny. Well, and we're, we're after hours, so it's not always the same. Um, let's see. But in any case, I, I've got my hotkeys to sell up on the ask, either half or quarter positions, so I can start to scale out into strength. And one of the other things I was going to show you guys is this um, scanner. And this is the last thing I'll show you. Uh, this scanner here with trade ideas is programmed to look for the type of stocks I like to trade. And I can just double click this and it immediately populates here. So it just makes it super, super fast. Um, you know, I don't have to, I just, I don't have to enter it twice. I can just press it once and, and jump right in. Let's see. There we go. Get that zoomed in a little bit more. All right, guys. So um, again, uh, just a reminder, uh, we'll be hosting a webinar over at Warrior Trading. Uh, for those of you who are here in this live um, webinar tonight, uh, we'll definitely be hosting one tomorrow, uh, but we do host them uh, from time to time. So uh, if you're watching the recording, feel free to make your way over to Warrior Trading. Um, if you want to uh, see more videos, go to YouTube. You can search us uh, for Warrior Trading on YouTube. Check us out on Facebook. Uh, stop by the website, warriortrading.com, and I hope I will uh, see you guys at some point uh, in the chat room, part of the community. Uh, we'd love to have you. All right? So... Uh, again, I thank you guys uh, for having me today, and I want to thank uh, Rob for putting this together, and be excited to do it again soon. Thanks so much, Ross. That was great. I'm sure everyone got a lot out of it. I know I did. That's uh, a lot of people need to really look up the risk management and, and, and have a strategy and, and you really laid out some really key points. I hope everyone was really taking notes here and obviously they should take a look at some more of your webinars and, and join your your room as well. So uh, we, we thank you for presenting here today. Everyone, please note this will be on the website and we hope to have Ross come back again to uh, share some more thoughts as well. So uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thank Ross for the presentation and uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you very much.